Um, so thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to talk about the role of cerebral palsy or role of physical therapy and cerebral palsy, because I think um, in coordination with so many other members of the healthcare team that you guys have present today, we have the opportunity to make a really positive impact on the lives of these patients. Thank you guys again for that really generous introduction. Um, I've been really lucky with my experience at Kennedy Krieger, as well as my residency, to have the opportunity to see patients with cerebral palsy um, across the lifespan, as well as across the care continuum. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share those experiences with you guys today. The objectives of today, um, we won't spend too much time on the first few, as I know the definition of cerebral palsy um, and the ICF model were discussed in prior presentations. Um, and we, the bulk of the presentation will include talking about common impairments that we see in patients with cerebral palsy and the specific assessments and treatments that we'll do for those patients. And then also a focus on how we can address activity limitations and participation restrictions as well. The definition, the definition of cerebral palsy, as I know you guys heard a lot today, is it's a group of permanent disorders of development of movement and posture causing activity limitation that are attributed to a non-progressive disturbance that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. The motor disorders of cerebral palsy are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, and behavior. It is the most common childhood onset motor disorder diagnosis, and it also has the highest global burden of disease among all of the non-communicable disease, chronic diseases that were evaluated at the Rehabilitation 2030 World Health Organization Conference in 2019 because of its prevalence, the fact that it starts so early in life, as well as its severity. As you also discussed in previous presentations, the GMFCS level is a very common classification that will be used for patients with cerebral palsy. And we specifically use this a lot in physical therapy because it certainly affects the interventions that we would choose. Um, for example, the treatment plan for a patient who's GMFCS level five is often quite different from that of a patient who's a GM, GMFCS level one or two. According to the American Physical Therapy Association, physical therapists are movement experts who improve the quality of life through prescribed exercise, hands-on care, and patient education. Um, we participate widely in rehabilitation, which as defined by the World Health Organization, is a set of interventions designed to optimize functioning and reduce disability in individuals with a health condition in interaction with their environment. As a lot of other providers reference this morning, uh, we use the ICF model to develop our plans of care and really help us think um, about each patient as an individual to de design an individual treatment plan for them. And I've chosen to use this ICF model as um, a way to organize the information that I'm presenting to you guys today. Um, certainly I will say I organized it by impairments and there's a lot of specific um, assessments for certain impairments, but with treatments, a lot of times we're addressing more than one impairment. So I do want to emphasize that even though I might have included a particular treatment on one slide, it could certainly address multiple impairments. I just wanted to express to you guys the large variety of interventions that physical therapy can do. Um, so the role of PT across um, within cerebral palsy, it certainly evolves over time based on patient age the care setting they're seen in. So the hospital, early intervention, inpatient rehab, school, outpatient community, as well as patient and family goals. I can't emphasize that enough. I can see two patients that have a very similar presentation, but they might have very different goal sets and therefore my plan for them would be very different. Some common PT activities are, I can't emphasize enough, coordination with the healthcare team, especially because a lot of times our physical therapy intervention will be in coordination with some type of, you know, neurosurgical or orthopedic um, intervention. Um, assessment, treatment, equipment trials and recommendations, home exercise program prescription, community program recommendation, and then a huge one is prevention of unnecessary disability due to secondary impairments 
um, that you guys talked a lot about today already, such as scoliosis, the you know negative effects that abnormal muscle tone can have if not treated properly, such as contractures. So the most common impairments that we see in physical therapy, certainly this isn't an exhaustive list, there are more, but I wanted to focus on the most common ones given the time limitation we have today, mm -hmm. um, include abnormal muscle tone, decreased range of motion and muscle flexibility, decreased muscle strength, impaired selective motor control, decreased proprioception, kinesthesia and body awareness, impaired balance and postural reactions, and impaired endurance. Um, abnormal muscle tone. Also, you will see on a lot of the slides, I've cited the NINDS common data elements. If you guys aren't familiar with that, I would definitely encourage you to go to that site. They, it's not just for physical therapists. They have compiled recommended outcome measures and assessment tools for a variety of impairments and conditions for cerebral palsy to kind of have um, clinicians from across the country and across the world collect as uniform a data set as possible so that we can better inform practice. Some common um, assessments we use, which I certainly know have limitations such as the modified Ashworth scale, um, the Tardu scale commonly for spasticity, the Barry Albright dystonia scale, we do that a lot for dystonia. I know I've been doing that a lot in practice because a lot of our PMNMR docs have been prescribing more Cinemet for dystonia and a lot of time pre-starting Cinemet and post-starting Cinemet, they'll have me do that outcome measure to see how we're doing. Um, the hypertonia assessment tool, that's really great for patients with mixed tone that you're trying to discern what different types of tone are present between dystonia, spasticity, and rigidity and the dyskinesia impairment scale. Some treatments that we can do include strength training, which obviously primarily improves strengths, but some literature suggests that it can improve spasticity, manual therapy, and electrical stimulation. Decreased range of motion and muscle flexibility. Some common things we'll use to assess that include range of motion, orthopedic tests to assess specific muscle flexibility, such as the Duncan Eli or the Thomas, the popliteal angle. Um, and then definitely we want to keep a close eye on skeletal alignment, especially in those lower GMFCS levels, given we know the risk of scoliosis development. Things that we use commonly include the spinal alignment range of motion measure, as well as a detailed postural assessment. Some interventions that we commonly do are serial casting. A lot of times that's coordinated with our um, docs post Botox. And you'll see I've quoted the Novak article a couple times here. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, it's a group went through a bunch of literature about interventions, not necessarily physical therapy specific for patients with cerebral palsy and gave them kind of a green light, yellow light, red light based on what the literature says solely. So serial casting did get a green light. Um, and I know in my personal practice, I've seen a lot of improvement with that in the ankle dorsiflexion range of motion specifically. Um, manual therapy and a prolonged low load stretch. And what I'm talking about here is not telling parents to stretch a hamstring for 30 seconds twice a day. That's gonna do nothing. Um, what I'm talking about more here is opportunities for a prolonged low load stretch just as sleeping in a knee immobilizer or getting in a stander for like 30 to 45 minutes, three to five times a week at least. Um, muscle weakness and decreased strength. We have a lot of different assessments for this. Um, isokinetic muscle strength testing, manual muscle testing. In our clinic a lot more, we're doing handheld dynamometry that certainly um, you know, isn't as accurate as the gold standard of that isokinetic manual muscle testing that you can get with a Biodex but I do think it gives you a lot more objective information than manual muscle testing alone because it can actually give you a force in newtons or pounds um, for every muscle group throughout the lower extremity that you wanna know. And I found that really helpful and um, they do have normative values for kids six through eight. Um, and then Bohannon has some nice normative values for adults 20 and older, but I found it really helpful for kind of pre and post um, intervention comparing of a patient to themselves. And then we also do a lot of functional mobility assessments of strengths for those patients who have those selective motor control impairments, such as a five time sit to stand or a timed up and go, a timed up and downstairs. There's a lot of literature on strength training um, and a lot of choices for PTs to make. Some common interventions include multi-joint exercises such as step ups or sit to stands. 
um, leg presses. Novak and his team did give strength training a green light as well, though the literature on that kind of suggests that as, um, you know, exercise specialists, we really need to be focusing on improving the intensity um, and specificity of the exercises we're describing and really implementing a one rep max more into our practice if possible. And Noelle Moreau and her team have done beautiful work out of um, New Orleans to characterize that better. And electrical simulation. And normally for strengthening, I'll pair that with a functional task such as a squat or ambulation and have the electrical simulation come on at the certain time that I want a patient to use a specific muscle group. Impaired selective motor control. Um, the scale is really good at assessing this. It's selective control of the assessment of the lower extremity. And some interventions um, that are great at helping with this include constraint-induced movement therapy for the upper extremity specifically, treadmill training with and without a partial body weight support, such as a light gate, and then aquatic therapy. I've had a lot of success with that for my patients with impaired selective motor control because it gives them a gravity eliminated or gravity free environment, depending on the height of the water. Um, and I've seen patients, you know, begin to develop some night movement skills there. And then we work to get that functional carryover to land. Decreased proprioception, kinesthesia, and body awareness. There are certainly some very specific tests that we can do for proprioception and kinesthesia. I have not had a lot of my patients with cerebral palsy be able to participate in those assessments. So a lot of times I'll rely on my functional movement analysis skills. Um, for example, observing you know, how a patient participates or does on an obstacle course, or is you know, a patient who's ambulatory and able to stand, able to kind of play a Simon Says game with me and mirror certain movements that I'm doing. Some treatments that include for this um, are neurodevelopmental treatment, which um, is a specific training in certain handling skills um, that promote um, certain movement patterns with the goal of decreasing therapist facilitation. I'm not personally certified in this, but I have learned some techniques from some of my colleagues who are, and I have found it beneficial to incorporate into my treatment. Um, obstacle courses, and then we can also use equipment to increase proprioceptive awareness for those patients who just seem to have no regard for either their entire body or a certain area, such as weighted vests or ankle weights or um, therapy balls. And then I've also found um, different yoga techniques really helpful to improve patient awareness. And I know a lot of patients are doing that in school and in gym class now, so they think that is fun as well. Um, we commonly see impaired balance and postural reactions. Some things I will use to assess this include response to perturbations, the Berg balance scale. There's also a pediatric version, the functional reach test, the segmental assessment of trunk control and the trunk control measurement scale. And the last two again are for those patients who can more follow a lot of specific commands. Um, some interventions that we will use to address this include treadmill training, again, with or without a body weight support system, such as a light gate or a Goldman lift, depending on patient needs. And then static and dynamic sitting and standing balance activities with the incorporation of equipment to progress as a patient needs. And a lot of times that's the incorporation of some type of unstable surface, whether it's an Airx foam or a wobble board. Uh, impaired endurance is a huge one in this population. Um, and certainly we use a variety of um, timed function tests to assess this, such as a 10 meter walk test or a six minute walk test. The muscle power sprint test is nice for those higher level patients who specifically want to assess muscle power. They have to be pretty high level because it's kind of like um, six sprints in a row and you're assessing their heart rate and stuff between each. Um, and the energy expender in expenditure index, which certainly is not as reliable as like a VO2 max test, but it's something really nice we can use in clinic to get some objective information because you just need a heart rate, a distance that a patient walked and a time. So certainly if patients are on medications that blunt their heart rate to exercise, heart rate response to exercise, this is not a good um, assessment tool, but for those patients who are not, I found it really great. Some treatments include cycling, wheelchair propulsion, one, running, swimming, walking with the incorporation of the appropriate assistive device as needed and arm cycling. Um, pain in cerebral palsy. I know this was 
hit on earlier and I gave it kind of its own slide before I even talked about assessment and treatment because I feel like in my own personal practice as well as in the literature, um, you know, it's highlighted a lot these days how in pain these children and adults with cerebral palsy are. We know that the majority of children with cerebral palsy experience pain as a common symptom. There's the highest frequency and severity of pain in children with the greatest impairment. Pains reported in two thirds of adults with cerebral palsy. We have pain prevalent in 85% of the children and adolescents with dyskinetic and mixed cerebral palsy. And pain is the number one limiting factor to participating in physical activity for adults with disability. So I feel like this is a huge problem. And I think um, as healthcare providers who serve this population, we're still um, trying to learn ourselves what's best practice and um, perform better studies to inform the literature. And I know, you know, how e the interventions I've done to address pain in my patients with cerebral palsy has been different and the responses have been different as well. Um, we have a lot of different assessment tools that we can use, um, including the FLAC. That's validated in infants, but I will use it in my older patients with cerebral palsy who have pretty significant cog cognitive impairment as well. The FACES scale, the visual analog scale, the caregiver's pain survey, Health Utilities Index 3, the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance Body Diagram, the Pediatric Pain Profile, um, some treatments that I've really worked to do are to improve postural symmetry. There's been shown to, you know, those patients, which you can assume with the highest degrees of postural asymmetry report more pain. So any type of intervention that we can do to improve postural symmetry can certainly decrease pain. Um, manual therapy. I've seen a lot of great results with aquatic therapy, especially with my patients with GMFCS level four and five. The difficulty is kind of getting that carry over to land because a lot of times the relief that the they'll get will only last for you know the longest three to four days, sometimes the shortest 30 minutes. And then any type of movement, whether it's partial body weight support system, movement on a treadmill, getting the patient in a stander, doing segmental rolling activities on the mat. This is very specific to a patient and their own abilities. Um, next, we'll get to activity limitations and participation restrictions. And what you'll see kind of here is that, um, you know, there's a lot of literature on different ways we can assess and treat impairments, but when it comes to activity limitations and participation restrictions, the ways that we can intervene aren't greatly reported in the literature. Um, and I think it's, you know, because of some of the issues people have reported earlier. Like this is such a heterogeneous population. It's so difficult to characterize. Um, so, so activity limitations are the decreased ability to perform typical functional movement tasks for their age group. The most common concern of parents as discussed in earlier presentations is walking. And in physical therapy, a lot of times, you know, we will do an examination and then discuss with the family that that might always not be a realistic or optimal goal. And we also may need to look at efficiency and consider our alternative means of mobility. And certainly, you know, we talk about what is walking, what is the definition of walking to a family? Like, you know, this, while this patient might not walk out in the community, we can certainly get them possibly to do some household ambulation or do ambulation as a form of exercise. So we just have to talk with families and get on the same page about what the purpose of the walking is or how that would look for a patient. Um, and then as was discussed earlier, you know, kind of the classic predictor of walking would be, you know, if a patient is not independently sitting by the age of two, um, it's be, gonna be difficult for that child to walk independently. Um, other things that kind of correlate with independent walking include visual and hearing impairments and the presence of epilepsy as well as cognitive function. Participation restrictions relate to a child's ability to participate in typical life situations with their family, peers, or within the community. And predictors of participation in cerebral palsy are associated with gross motor function classification system level. So certainly those ones and twos have a lot easier time with participation than those fours and fives. Hand function, cognition, and the environment. So, you know, I know patients who live, you know, specifically in different counties in Maryland have access to different um, community resources. And it's worth noting that participation is highest across all levels 
of cerebral palsy in Denmark, actually, because of all of the legislation that they have towards equal access of resources for patients with disabilities. Um, activity. There is a ton, and this is not an exhaustive list. These are just the most common ones that I use in my clinic um, to assess activity. There's a ton of outcome measures. So the gross motor function measure 66, the pediatric outcomes data collection instrument, there's a lot of these. Um, treatment includes health promotion education. We do a lot of equipment trials to increase activity. Specifically in my clinic, we try out a lot of standards and a lot of gait trainers. Just anything we can do to try to get patients as active and moving as much as they can in their home and community, community environments instead of just physical therapy being the only place that they move. And home exercise program prescription. Um, I wanted to highlight the work by Mark Peterson and his team at the University of Michigan, because they've been doing such a lovely job to talk about the need to increase activity levels in patients with cerebral palsy. This study um, out of developmental medicine and child neurology, they summarized um, activity levels from multiple studies about patients with cerebral palsy. And essentially what we're seeing here is that 76 to 99% of um, or patients with cerebral palsy spend 76 to 99% of their waking hours participating in sedentary behavior. This is a huge problem because we know about the negative effects of sedentary behavior on cardiovascular health, on metabolic health in um, typically developing individuals. And Dr. Peterson and his group have shown that the risk factors for sedentary behavior in patients with cerebral palsy are at least tenfold. Um, so we certainly need to do everything we can as providers to get these patients moving as much as possible. They've also developed recommendations for exercise and physical activity prescription for people with cerebral palsy. I'm putting these here as a reference. This is certainly something we could talk about for hours. Um, I just want to highlight the place that I've personally started in my own practice is the sedentary behavior and the thought of having patients try to spend less than two hours a day participating in sedentary behavior, which obviously is not realistic for our GM FCS level four and fives, or thinking about breaking up that sedentary behavior every 30 to 60 minutes for at least two minutes. So whether it's just a sit to stand transfer or pressure relief um, for a patient in a wheelchair, really thinking about doing that throughout the day instead of just thinking, oh, you know, sit all day in your wheelchair and then try to get in a gait trainer for 30 minutes. That's not really going to help avoid all of these secondary complications due to sedentary behavior. Um, some activity examples here include, these are just pictures of different standards, gait trainers, adaptive tricycles that we use. Um, participation. Again, there's a ton of different outcome measures we can do for this. The treatment is really not well studied in the literature, but in my own personal practice, I've just kind of served as a consultant and collaborating with family and community providers to kind of come up with creative ways that we can get these children and adults participating as much as possible in activities that are of value to them. Um, some national organizations and resources that I found really helpful to share with families include AACPDM, UCP, the Inclusive Fit Colon Delition, NICPAD, and then just really familiarizing myself with the adapted and integrated sports in the Baltimore area where I treat patients. Um, so in conclusion, the role of physical therapy varies throughout the lifespan of the patient with cerebral palsy, depending on the setting, impairments, and patient and family goals. Coordinated care between a multidisciplinary team will provide the best outcomes for children and adults with cerebral palsy. And we need to work on encouraging all of our patients to be as active as possible to decrease um, disability related to secondary impairments and comorbidities. And I included all my references in case you guys want to read up more on things that I discussed. Now I am ready for questions. Um, I see one in the chat from Natalie. Um, it said, I've heard, I've heard a physician say children with cerebral palsy should always be in physical therapy. Can you speak on this and the current pusher trend for therapists to treat episodically? That is a really great question. That is certainly something that we have been struggling with at our institute because I feel like all the literature says, you know, short intensive bouts of care are certainly better than 
these old school bouts of care where we're seeing these patients once a week for 20 years. And I think especially some of our older physicians who are more used to that model of care um, have made this these short-term intensive, intensive bouts kind of difficult to adapt because, you know, for example, I, as a PT will say, oh, let's try to, you know, let's think of physical therapy as a sport. If you have a typically developing child, they're not, you know, it's, they're normally not doing a sport year round. You have seasons of sports for a reason. Let's think of physical therapy as a sport. And we will, you know, do this for eight or 12 weeks, really focus on these one or two things that you want to. And then, Hey, why don't you come and see me over the summer? Like focus on school. You're doing soccer this time. Like, let's give you some time to be a kid, enjoy your life. And if a family is not happy with that, they'll go complain to a physician who then is complaining to my boss. Um, So I will say it's definitely hard. And I do think I also explained to the difference to parents between, you know, just because I want to decrease your frequency and do some skilled monitoring for these secondary assessments and see you in three to six months, I'm not discharging you. I would, I think you would benefit from skilled monitoring and I'm always here for you. If, and if we see some problems, we'll increase that frequency again. But I do think um, it is really important. And I think it varies across institutions and even, you know, colleagues in my department have different feelings about that. So um, I think sometimes just it, using the term kind of skilled monitoring or decrease in frequency is better than the term discharge. Cause I think some patients and physicians have a negative connotation to the word discharge. Yeah, am I still echoing? No, you're good, Dr. Perry. This I'm sounds good. good. So Brittany, thanks very much for that. So my question for you has to do with, um, you know, what are some of the common reasons for, um, you know, for patients that patients with CP that tend to have a decline sometimes when the parent come in, parents come and tell you my child has lost function and things like that. What are some of the common reasons for that you've seen, especially those reasons that are amenable to getting better and where you've intervened and you've done something? I'm very curious to know what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like it's just kind of um, a combination of a lot of comorbidities. Um, For example, I had one patient who had put on a significant amount of weight, was having significant pain. Um, So we actually did a, with his, his PM&R did some Botox. He counted with nutrition and saw me. We did aquatic-based intervention and land-based intervention, really focused at increasing his heart rate and endurance. And he actually lost like 30 pounds he was feeling a lot better and then ended up participating in wheelchair rugby and did really well. So I think it's tough because it's not just one thing. I also think kind of that adolescent to adulthood transition is really tough. These kids get bigger. It gets harder to move around. There's also so many less services available to adults with cerebral palsy in comparison to children. Um, So I think it's a really big combination of things. I feel like I wish that I could say, oh, I do this one thing and I think everybody can help. But I think the biggest thing, um, kind of I'm really inspired by Dr. Peterson's work of just thinking how we can improve our patient's activity each day and see if we can somehow beat that decline for those patients who are more active each day than those patients who just come to PT to get worked out for like 60 minutes a week. I don't think we're making a big difference there. What do uh, growth spurts do to children's function and mobility sometimes? And the other question is, um, you know, have you seen any downsides or loss of function related sometimes to the use of oral baclofen? Um, So growth spurts, I for sure, a lot of times I'll see patients, especially for bouts of serial casting around growth spurts, um, or will increase knee immobilizer wear for hamstrings at night, um, and then try to get that daily prolonged low load stretch with like a standard or something after that. So I feel like a bout of PT with a growth spurt is very recommended, especially for those adolescents. Um, and then with oral baclofen, um, we have seen some sedation sometimes with the oral baclofen. A lot of times we work in close combination with the PM and R docs um, about and coordinate with the parents and stuff about the dosing. Um, but I haven't, I've actually not seen like a Besides sedation, I haven't really seen a huge loss in function with the baclofen. And a lot of times if the docs, if we don't see a ton of change and they need more, those are the patients that might go on for like a baclofen pump. Thank you. 